Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the Creating Inclusive and Welcoming Communities and Workplaces webinar. My name is Kenya Colton, and I am a Supervisor of Policy and Strategic Issues at the City of London. I would like to start our meeting in a good way by acknowledging the Indigenous people whose traditional territory we have gathered on today. I also encourage you to take a moment to think about the land you are situated on and acknowledge the Indigenous people past and present. This land was once, once settled by the Wandering, later the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee used these lands as their traditional hunting grounds. The three long-standing indigenous groups of this region are the Anishinaabe, including the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, the Haudenosaunee, including Mohawk, Oneida, Cayuga, Onondaga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations, and Lenny Lenape, also referred to as Delaware or Muncie. I'd like to recognize the three First Nation communities neighboring the City of London, Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. I'd like to acknowledge the many long-standing treaty relationships between Indigenous nations in Canada. We recognize that all levels of government in Canada have a responsibility to honor the nation-to-nation -nation relationship and that individually, we all have a role to play in honoring the treaties and contributing, contributing to reconciliation. I also acknowledge my role as a settler and that I benefit from the continuing colonization of this land. I recognize my responsibility for reconciliation towards the First People. Welcome to this meeting and thank you for being with us. And with that, I will now pass it off to Fabio to introduce the uh, today's panelists. Thank you, Kinga. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fabio Bonfim. I am the Employee Mentorship Team Lead and also a member of the CDIS Strategy 5. I'm here to talk to the panel and we're going to share some strategies and uh, policies that we can use to be a very welcome community. So my first panelist is Alicia Moser. Alicia is a driven business strategist, diversity and inclusion champion, entrepreneur and thought leader with a background in corporate sales and leadership. She holds a master's in business administration with a specialization in sustainable commerce as she remains committed to embedding social responsibility practices within corporate infrastructure. Alicia is a passionate community activist host and executive producer of the award-winning talk show, Melante, the centered on the intersectionality of the Black Canadian experience. Alicia has cultivated over 15 years of experience inspiring tangible change in the advancement of equality measures to promote the inclusion and diversity within the communities in which she serves. Alicia, thank you so much for being here today. And now, I pass the floor to you so that you can talk a little bit about your organization. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Kempel, for having me. I think it's such a wonderful opportunity, and it really speaks to our ability to partner as a community and share best practices because this uh, journey to inclusion and inclusive and equitable based society is not just, you know, one fight. And our corporations, especially our large corporations, have a big part to play in this. So I'm very excited today because I represent TD Canada Trust, which within the London community has a large footprint um, when we think about corporate presence and the amount of employee share that we have and what we do in our community directly to support London. So I'm excited to kind of share with this group around some of the different approaches that we've taken on how to create both an inclusionary business structure and model, but also how to look at retaining uh, our growth, our new to comer, new to Canada, refugee-based talent, and diverse talent populations. So I want to be able to impart some of our learnings back to you so you can take those back to your employment uh, and really look to sustain and embed tangible change. So one of the key things that I would call out is when you're looking at how do I make an inclusive workplace, how do I create true systemic change, it's always starting with understanding your community. So with TD, we support 2,500 diverse communities across the country. So when I think about how do we earn space or how do we earn to really understand what our acquisition strategy will be, it's first understanding the needs of the community and placing ourselves within that community. That would be the primary step where I've seen a lot of our success. When we look at that and we set up our business model to really um, complement that mentality, we look at inclusion and embed it all the way through our business structure from the top down. So when we think about you know, the call to action today, and I don't know if you've all looked at the recent Washington Post article, 
but about 50% of our Gen Z population call that their CEOs that they're looking at prospective companies should be advocates, should be present within the community and have an active voice. And when you're looking at employers for consideration, 60% of job seekers look for their employer to have an active space within the diverse community and presence. So we really, really hold true to that data to say, what is our presence? Let's tangibly look at it. Where are we doing well? Where is there an opportunity where we've either misserved or misserved our employee internal populations? Looking at that representation data, but then again, looking at the needs of the community to really ground ourselves. So a lot of the secret to that success, it, it's really not a secret. It's about basic humanitarian practices. So when you're building a business structure and model, looking at, you know, how do I incubate and get diverse thought and doing that through inclusion? Because diversity is based off, rep, um, you know, brand, gender, race. Those are one pieces and you can bring in diverse talent, but they'll never stay if you haven't created an inclusive and safe cultural environment. So from the top down, we look at our hiring practices. We've built robust models within our HR structure, within our business leadership structure. We've invested a lot of time and calories on inclusive leadership practices from our leadership team, all of our people managers, because again, once we bring them in through our acquisition strategies with our diversity uh, sourcing team, we want to make sure that that talent stays, that we cultivate, that we grow them, that it's organic and authentic to them, and not that we're asking them to assimilate. We want them to bring in their culture because that diversity of thought is what makes our footprint so unique. So I think, again, one of the unique things that brought me into the organization early on in my infancy, uh, without dating myself on how long I've been here, but is a lot of that secret sauce and the commitment to that brand and that culture. So a lot of our colleagues stand tall. They're encouraged to stand up employee resource groups. Businesses and departments are encouraged to stand up business resource groups so that when I come in, whether it be as a newcomer to Canada, whether I come in as a, a black woman or um, part of a specific group like LGBTQ2 plus or a person with disability, I'm now surrounded and embraced by a community that actually serves me where I can see myself, not just represented within our leadership, but also within the community and directly around uh, with the peers that surround you. And looking at, you know, how do we incubate that through our external relationships? Because that's a huge component in earning a seat at our community's table. It's looking at financial literacy. It's looking at how you can invest your dollars within the community that you serve. How do we inspire those non-for-profit organizations and stand side by side with them to give them the adequate investment to do the, the sheer amount of change work they're able to invigorate within their community. So I would say end to end, you know, the message that I want to leave you with for TD is that it is sustainable no matter what size your business structure is to take bits and pieces from the learnings that you hear from all of us today from the big corporation perspective and take it back to your uh, business and say, okay, what tangible things can I do at our level with our access to resources? And there's always something that you can look to do to stand um, and be present within your community, starting with your people, starting with the culture, starting with a aligned vision. And then from there, once you have that respect and brand of your community, you'll be able to create a culture and ask again for that talent to come and consider your organization as a place to work. Great, thank you so much, Alicia. Now Great I'm gonna pleasure. go to Brandon Klassen, uh, is a panelist from 3M. He's a people relations leader in HR with 3M Canada, working out of the Morden, Manitoba manufacturing plant. Brenda has 20 years of experience working in various roles with 3M, primarily working as a people leader. Just recently, Brenda has taken on diversity and inclusion leader role for 3M Canada as embracing allyship and advocating for 3M Canada employees in his new role. Brendan is inspired daily by his wife and two kids. In his free time, Brenda enjoys time with family, biking, woodworking, and volunteering. Thank you for being here, Brandon. Please share your thoughts about how your organization embraces diversity. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, here at 3M Canada, um, we've got a great team and, and really um, one of the places where we like to focus, again, our headquarters being in, in London, Ontario, is to focus on connecting with companies like Employ and Will um, to work together on these initiatives. Um, again, as already heard, you know, really understanding our diverse community um, and being active in our community. Um, as we look at 3M Canada, we're really looking at, um, you know, where 3M Canada plays a role in the communities, you know, throughout every province.
province and really look for those opportunities where we're active in those communities um, and, and not just London, but really the broader three in Canada. Um, so, you know, with that comes some unique, unique and diverse um, talents and, and some unique and diverse um, situations where we, we encounter and, and look to um, really model what's going on and, and reflect, you know, who our customers are and, and, and what, uh, what our employees are looking for. So um, areas where we focus are, you know, educating our leaders and our HR teams um, on di diversity and inclusion and the importance of building um, the diverse workforces. It really starts with educating and understanding um, what's, why it's so important for us. Um, and, and through that, we're really looking to, you know, build our leaders and our teams here um, to ensure that we've got um, a place where employees are going to want to stay once they've been hired, right? I think it's important that we recognize that we have updated our hiring practices to include diversity and inclusion in initiatives. Um, we're creating a DNI um, employee resource networks here um, for folks to be connected and included once they join here. I mean, we're, we're really expecting and, and looking for um, that opportunity where people feel comfortable and, and we create that safe space and a place for folks um, that are going to want to stay here. Um, and that we also build diversity and inclusion into our culture here at work. Um, we'll talk more in some of the questions as we go through our cultural elements and kind of how we've built that into, in, into our uh, policy and process here. So, Thank you, Brandon. Now I'm going to go to Vivian Lee. So Vivian has over 15 years of experience in HR and HR technology with a special focus on diversity, inclusion, leadership, talent development, HR data analysis, and project management. Vivian holds a master's degree from China. She's a senior diversity inclusion leader working for, and her words, Canada's best diversity employer. Currently leading RBC's inclusive recruitment team Vivian designs and delivers enterprise-wide inclusive recruitment strategy to help RBC build its competitive edge through attracting and attaining an inclusive workforce with a special fo focus on talent from diverse and attaining a a communities such as persons with disabilities, Indigenous people, visible minorities, newcomers to Canada, LGBT+, women, etc. Between 2017 and 2021, Vivian and her team has supported over 5,000 candidates from diverse communities in their job searching through Diversity Works Here, RBC event series, workshops, training, and webinars. Due to her experience in do and why field, Vivian has been a keynote panelist and workshop facilitator in multiple external diversity inclusion related events and conferences. Internally, Vivian promotes inclusive hiring through building partnership, raising awareness in various inclusive hiring initiatives to promote talent from diversity communities. Vivian has designed and facilitated to remove hiring bias training for all RBC employees to support business in their inclusive hire best practices. Thank you so much for being here and please share your thoughts about your organization. Well, thank you, Fabio. As uh, you were reading, I just realized my bio was too long. I, I should have given you a shorter version. Uh, but thanks, everyone, and uh, very happy to be here. And after listening to Brandon and Alicia um, and a lot of the ideas, uh, I think I'm going to focus more on some actionable, some some tips and advice that's not only applicable to big organizations like RBC, because we are fortunate to have the resources and, and the budgets to implement some big diversity programs, but also, you know, some smaller and medium companies can, uh, can take uh, uh, into some actionable plans. Um, so um, a few things I want to mention. One is uh, from our, because I lead the inclusive recruitment team from recruitment side, um, you know, RBC on board around 12,000, uh, 1,200 uh, 1200 students um, this year. So the practice uh, and, and a little bit more last year and a few uh, before COVID, right? And the, the good practice that we've been implementing since three years ago is instead of going to only tier one universities, uh, which a lot of uh, uh, candidates or students from diverse communities do not have the opportunity and the support system 
uh, to, to have that opportunity, we go beyond tier one. We do not only go to Queens and the Western. Uh, we uh, visited them you know, physically or virtually over 100 Canadian universities and colleges. That actually uh, allows us to um, uh, access the broader talent pool and give more students with great potentials the opportunity to have that first experience working in uh, one of Canada's best diversity um, employer with the uh, with RBC. So that's something that we have been practicing. I'm very proud that this year that we have over 45% of our students that are from the uh, different diverse communities and uh, over 5% of our hires are from the black community, which um, is high way above Canada's workforce availability. And so that's the one thing, and the other thing is we build our diversity practice from talent client and the community perspective. Just use a newcomer as an example. Um, a few years ago, I approached our newcomer business segment in our personal and, uh, um, personal and commercial banking segment. And then we start building strategy, not only from serving our clients and the um, selling client, the credit cards, the bank card uh, perspective, but also how can we serve our client uh, on the value um, added, uh, value proposition. So we start um, organizing and uh, we have a very, very uh, good initiative called uh, Newcomer Meeting Place. With Newcomer Meeting Place, we not only um, serve the clients with their business need, but anything newcomer have, any question uh, from job searching, from how to file taxes, from uh, um, healthcare, understanding better Canadian healthcare uh, system. And we partner, my team partner with um, the business segment provide so many, I think it's uh, right now over a hundred um, job searching support um, workshops and events just to make sure that we're um, hiring from the community, we're also supporting the community. And also we, um, in diversity space, we used to go out and uh, spend big dollars uh, sponsoring a lot of events. Um, and that's also a part of the practice still, so, but we have uh, taken a good look at the, uh, the ROIs, whether we need to, and whether it allows us to have a better connection with our candidates. So we, we make some change to our practice. We start bringing those events back into RBC which means it allows the um, candidate to have that face-to-face -face opportunity to talk to our hiring managers and the recruiters on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then we also allow our uh, external uh, um, partner organizations to have that close relationship with our um, hiring managers and the recruiters. Before it was only my team, a few uh, members for, of my team going to those events and we bring piles of resumes back to our hiring managers. And a lot of the challenges people from diversity, diverse community face are not because they um, they don't have the potential and don't have the capability to do the job. And maybe they didn't have the opportunity to, to do the job yet. So the resume, the one size fits all resume um, would not put them um, in front of the hiring manager as the uh, favorable candidate, right? Because they just didn't have the opportunity to do it. But once we connect them one-on-one -on -one with our hiring managers, they actually um, can wow our recruiters and hiring managers. And that's something that we've been doing for the last few years and see great results. Um, especially, um, we see the reaction from hiring managers. Originally, they were very hesitant to go to our, say, uh, event for a person with disabilities or for uh, newcomers because the resumes do not show what they can do. But after meeting those people, um, their attitude totally changes. And Vivian, next time you have those events, do invite me. So that's one thing on the recruiting side, but we also build some programs supporting and empowering our recruiters and hiring managers in their inclusive hiring practice. Um, like Fabio mentioned in my bio, I um, and my team, we designed and uh, executed and facilitated 
the reverse hiring bias uh, training, which is enterprise wide. We uh, lead our hiring managers through different stages of a recruitment practice. From when you post a job, did you realize that women tend to um, apply when they uh, you know, meet 100% of requirements and a man apply when they meet 60% of requirements, uh, the, the practice. And the way you have a, a lot of must-haves in your job posting, you're shutting a lot of uh, uh, very, very capable candidate out of the door. And they don't even apply. So from from the job posting to a resume screening to interview, what are the blind spots that you need to check? And we want to make sure that we are not targeting that make people to try to shame people because everybody has unconscious bias. We want to make it that clear at the beginning. And it's a journey. It's not like after you attend one workshop, you're going to be bias free. Um, it's a constant daily practice. So, you know, I just want to share a few tips, um, you know, um, as some something to start thinking about in your uh, diversity and inclusion practice in your company. Back to you, Fabio. Thank you so much, Vivian. Very important tips. So thank you all uh, for the insightful presentations. Now we'll move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. We have a few predetermined uh, questions we want to ask the panelists and this time, and following this portion, we'll move to the questions for the attendees. So if you have any questions, you have the Q&A icon here in your screen. You can type it in and we're going to uh, try our best to answer all the questions that are going to come into us. Uh, so again, don't hesitate to, to, to send us your questions. So I'll make the most of it uh, asking everyone uh, those questions that we have right now. And I'm going to start with uh, Alicia. So our first question is, what does an inclusive community or workplace look like to you? So we spoke about inspiring the leadership, uh, starting from within the organization and getting together with the community. But how does it look like being a very inclusive community for you? That's a very, very good question. And I think it often, inclusion often, often gets confused with diversity. So inclusion to me uh, and, the, and to the framework that we built within the organization is how people feel at work. So although a company's workforce may be diverse, if employees don't feel safe, welcome, valued, respected, we've missed the mark on creating an inclusive culture. So in order to create that, or what does it look like? What does it feel like? It's really understanding the diversity of the people that you actually have in your employee understanding what it means and what their lived experience and how that translates into their work, how they bring them their best selves to work and how we allow and cultivate an environment that can do that. To Vivian's point, there's a lot of unconscious bias that are no fault. It's really around that acknowledgement. So really understanding again and empathizing with other cultures, understanding the lived experiences of other cultures, not saying that you need to, you know, go out and have those experiences of your own, but it's understanding that representation and that diversity within your team and pulling on the strengths of that instead of again, looking for them to fit a mold or look a certain way. And that again, to Vivian's point, transcends in how we even look at our hiring practices, right? A candidate doesn't have to look and feel the same way for us to truly be bringing in their talent and we'd be doing a disservice to our community and never create that inclusive diversity of thought if we weren't really to, willing to look at our strategies and our policies to incubate that level of change. So inclusion to me is moving past simply just acknowledging differences to embrace them, to have open dialogue and, and conversations, to know that when and colleagues are facing something or something's happening within their community, we think about you know the resurgence and, and what happened in 2020 with the death of George Floyd. We think about the most recent attacks within our Asian communities. It's being comfortable enough from the top down with our leadership team to say, let's have that conversation. Let's not shy away, although we're a financial institution, Let's acknowledge these conversations and have an open forum where we can talk about the real, very real realities and the dualities of who we are. Not just, you know, Ali or Alicia as an employee, but Ali and Alicia as a person and how that brings myself to work. So those would be two interchangeable things that when I think of an inclusive work environment are really important. And then bringing that community piece in. So again, what I said to her earlier, understanding the communities that we serve, embracing those communities to really say, you know, what is the framework? How do we make sure that if our branch managers are in a market, that they're empowered 
to take that same level of approach to understand, sit at the tables with their community members, celebrate the events or things that are important within their communities or within their colleagues and teams, because it's really not a status to get to a point of inclusion. It's a journey that we go through, and there's 100% going to be times where we don't get it right, because everyone's on a different spectrum and learning. It's really acknowledging that change, creating a based curriculum to say, here is how you learn or understand whether it's about our Indigenous culture, we've launched recent trainings, or within our Black community to break down systemic or anti-racist behaviors or practices. It's really digging into those places, getting uncomfortable to allow the inclusion to kind of flourish within our culture and our society. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. And I love what you said about uh, understanding uh, people and make them feel they belong because there's so much pressure uh, over the people to fit into and we don't pay attention to Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing this. Absolutely. Brendan, what are your thoughts about uh, what an inclusive community or workplace look like to you? From my perspective and, and the way we you know, look at things at 3M, you know, it really reflects our customers. Um, it's a place where everyone is and feels um, included and wants to be be there because they feel safe, welcome, value, and heard. Um, it's employees educated on DNI and it's companies walking the talk. Um, it's DNI built into the culture of the company and um, you know really the opportunity to bring challenging and controversial issues forward and knowing we have created that environment where you know we can have an open dialogue um, and be able to acknowledge and, and understand that and be able to connect um, to our employees and, and you know really open up that. Uh, that open conversation. So thank you, Brandon. Vivian, please share your thoughts. So to me, um, at one level is allow the em employees to feel it's safe to speak up and that they're able to bring their authentic self to work, right? Uh, but how to implement that? I think not only we need to have diverse representation at a senior, at a junior entry level and a mid level position, we really need to see the, at the top of the house, there's a diverse representation. So because uh, diversity of thought um, can bring uh, good benefit, a lot of uh, productivity, um, not only in the uh, operation level, but also at decision-making level. And that's the one of the key benefits of diversity and inclusion, right? Uh, you're able to have diversity of thought at decision-making level so that you can take that as a competitive advantage. And when the employees see a diverse representation at the top of the house, they know that they have the opportunity from a career advancement perspective, and they know they, uh, they can speak up. I like this perspective because every time we think about inclus inclusiveness, we think about skin color, ethnicity, and uh, race, and uh, religion and everything, but uh, we don't think about uh, diversity of ideas that are going to help tackle the daily challenges, right? It's pretty awesome. I'm going to ask Brendan right now, what are some actions you've taken to be more inclusive and speak to a specific program or policies you have in place that are aimed at making your organization more inclusive and diverse? Yeah, so at 3M, you know, what we've done is built diversity and inclusion into our cultural elements. Um, so we have a list of cultural elements that is one of our four pillars um, that we really focus on here at 3M. Um, and we've added those cultural elements to actually be included as part of our performance review. So it's an area where we really look at, as we're um, working throughout the year, part of our, our goal is to work with every employee and really make sure that we're all, all, all on the same page on you know, what those cultural elements are and really how um, we're trying to build that culture into um, you know, our business at 3M. Um, we've created a DNI inclusion council here um, as well as ERNs. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit more in some of the, the following questions as well. Um, but we've created uh, um, employee resource networks here, um, Pride Multicultural Abilities First Women's Leadership Forum. Um, we're also um, starting to uh, um, add to that. Um, we're looking at building an Indigenous ERN here. Um, we've just got a call out for members on that one right now. And um, we're looking at some new employee opportunity networks that we're looking to uh, to start this year as well. So. Well, thanks for sharing this, Brendan. Vivian, can you share with us some uh, policies and examples that you have to share? Uh, so RBC uh, has been the largest host with uh, an internship pro a program called Career Edge. 
I don't know whether uh, you know anybody knows about this program. So this is something I want to highlight because a lot of uh, people from diverse communities, um, they don't have the opportunity to have their first experience because of the challenges they have gone through, whether it's because of disability, whether it's because of their newcomers to Canada, right? So in order to support those people to have, to get their first experience, we have been participating in this internship program and really allow the talented internationally trained professionals to come to RBC and get their first experience or students with disabilities who wouldn't see themselves competitive uh, compared to other students in the internship opportunities that they get uh, after they graduate if their resume does not show that many internships as other uh, people so they get the opportunity to work in RBC and they have that on their resume and we do convert a big percentage of our interns into our full-time employees. So, so I feel um, programs like that targeted uh, towards the, the communities that traditionally would feel, would have the employ, uh, employment barriers that would help tremendously uh, from uh, the uh, disadvantaged, uh, uh, for the disadvantaged community. Thank you so much. Alicia, can you share some thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, from my peers on the panel, we're all, you know, massive corporations within this footprint. So we'll have a lot of similarities, you know, both to Vivian um, and Brandon's point, having inclusive leadership structures. So and having committees at the top of the house, but then within representative within every business so that the accountability is driven top down, that every people leader is committed back to that brand to what is aligned to the moral compass and what it means to wear like your TV shield and sense of pride and what that means as far as the commitment to the framework. So similar to what Brandon said, we have our pillars that are entrenched within the three C's that we call our customers, our community, and then our, our entire uh, colleague structure. So when we think about it that way and we break out our value chain or our structure within the business, there's so many different ways, similar to what Vivian and Brandon said, that we can embed ourselves and embed inclusion and diversity within every aspect of our business, whether it be from our operational structure. So when we look at a diversity um, supplier chain, so making sure that when you know we do anything within the market, whether it be from inventory, whether it be from product marketing, advertising, that we're making sure that we create space for diverse voices, for diverse small businesses to connect and partner with us, to have that reciprocity model so that we're entrenched within the community. But even further than that, it goes to what we touched on earlier, our diversity sourcing, to not just go to the tier one schools, to go into the community, to go and partner with organizations like Employ, to bring our TD employees back and let's say, let's do mentorship programs where our TD employees, like what we're doing with Employ, sit at the table with the community, share our talents and learnings of what we've cultivated and what it means to be a TD colleague and impart that with our community frontline so that you're getting that one-to-one -one pairing relationship, whether it be through programs like this with Employ, whether it be through graduate leadership programs, similar to what Vivian has within um, RBC, those are your gateways. Those are your connection points to kind of throw away the conventional model where you sit on campuses um, at these high tiered schools. It's really, again, what are the not-for-profit organizations that are doing the work and how do you earn that seat at their table bring their talent in, offer financial literacy courses. Those are a lot of big base programs. When we think about those three C's to the community that we said, nope, this is a hard line for us. We wanna grow our community. We wanna incubate the talent, earn a right so that they consider us as a, as a tangible or considerable employer, but create that acumen up front and then bring them in so that we can cultivate them in a safe space, not penalizing anyone, but allowing them to grow with that talent approach, with through again, graduate leadership, or through again, new to bank or refugee based programs that we have with Tent, for example, where we really, again, wanna recognize these niche markets, but not just hire and insert them into the business structure. Bring them in, hear from them, have those diverse conversations to say, what's wrong with our business practices? And the hard part, when you think about these large space corporations is sitting in that. Sitting in that level of uncomfortability when you hire an indigenous colleague or you hire a refugee, refugee that's new to Canada and they say to you, hey, your product lineup on how you sell a basic product like a GIC investment, that's not how we talk about that in my homeland. How can we create product-based communications that we're actually connecting with the communities that we serve? 
that's those, those are some examples where I'm saying that we embedded in all aspects of our business model to really make sure that we're empowering leaders, not just to have events, but to be genuine and to be purposeful and to really, again, make that, that dollar investment back into those three Cs, your colleagues, your communities, and your customers to, again, earn that right authentically, authentically at the table. That's great. I love those ideas. And uh, I wanted to go back to what Brendan said about the performance review, including uh, diversity inclusion in the discussion. And performance review is a good way to hone leadership skills and uh, to help people grow, right? And because all of you mentioned about uh, the partnerships that we have between our, among our organizations, I would say that mentorship is a good opportunity to have awareness on diversity. And doesn't mean only for uh, immigrants, any minority group, you can coach someone is going to be a two way street relationship where you are going to learn the hardships that they go through, but also they're going to learn about your company, your organization. I think it's a pretty uh, nice way to, to put together the two sides of the coin and make everybody grow. So my third question is, what is an advice you would give to a business working on creating an inclusive workplace? I'm going to start with Vivian right now. To create an inclusive workplace, I think we should start with the senior executive level. Um, so we should have leaders championing the diversity and inclusion and building that, help build that diverse and inclusion culture. Um, for example, establish some, some diversity leadership councils and track your progress and have some uh, uh, measurements in place and what does get tra tracked and get measured gets done, right? So we have to have some actionable plans and also we need the grassroots support like ERGs supporting the strategy in your company about diversity and inclusion. And like Alicia mentioned about what is diversity, what is inclusion, right? There is a very interesting uh, anal uh, analogy. Um, diversity is who you invite to the party and the inclusion is who you invite to dance. So it's not only about bringing the people in, it's about how to engage your employees so that they can bring their authentic self to, uh, to work and they can contribute as much as they can to bring that diversity of thought into your company. So that's very, very important. The other thing is that in your hiring practice, are we enabling and empowering our recruiters and hiring managers? And not to just put them high and dry, say you need to do inclusive and, um, and inclusive hiring, right? What are the tools we have built to enable those hiring managers? For example, we provide the, the, uh, the remote hiring bias training, but we also provide a lot of tools um, encouraging the hiring managers, hey, when you talk to a recruiter, did you ask the recruiter to present you the diverse lead of candidate? That's one thing. And the other thing is a lot of people from diverse communities, they might not um, have as a shining resume as your top candidate. But even just to take the time, like you mentioned, Babel, just to take the time, I have a coffee chat with the person who made to the top of the last round of interview. That helps tremendously to that individual and really help them improve and uh, find out the, the skill gaps needed to be uh, successful in the next um, round of um, job ap applications. And the other thing is that when you ask and bring people in, do you ask questions about diversity and inclusion? Are you going to bring people in with that mindset, that inclusive leadership mindset? Right? For example, how did you manage a diverse team? If your team are, are, were made of different cultures and different ethnicity and a religious background, and there was a conflict, how did you manage to resolve the conflict? So put those um, as actionable uh, tips for our hiring managers. I think that's going to help us build a diverse workforce from the beginning when you bring someone in and then to, um, the, the, the process of developing and build your succession plans. Brandon, can you share your thoughts, please? Yeah, so similar to what Vivian had mentioned as well, you know, it really starts from the top um, and setting those goals, but it's really built from the employee's engagement. Um, again, we, we have created a council and an ERNs here 
Um, and it really starts as a, at a grassroots level. Um, you know, what we did in, in 3M Canada is we started with an inclusion survey out to our employees to really get that baseline and get that understanding of where are we? Um, what are the gaps? Where are our barriers? Where are our challenges? And understand from there where, where those opportunities were. And, and, and we built our um, pillars and, and we built our um, goals for the next year to work through those, um, you know, and that included education. That included you know, working with leaders and, and uh, creating safe spaces. So those are the things that we really focused on. Um, but again, it, it's also, we recognize that importance of, you know, on the council and on the year ends, um, it's so important to have that um, executive champion um, and, and make sure that, that we've got that engagement from the top um, and, and that employees see, um, see that in, in, in action. Thank you so much. Alicia, can you share your thoughts, please? Yeah, those are all great tips shared from my fellow panelists. So, I mean, just to add on to it, I would say uh, something that Vivian said really resonated. And, and it's something that we embrace and I see in our CEO and leader. And it's really around going beyond the optics. People will identify if you are not genuine. So if you're, you know, checking a box and you're coming up with a public commitment or you know, you're, you're publicly doing something and it's not genuine and it's not based or backed by investment. So every company, you know, there's different sizes to Vivian's point earlier, small, medium, there's a large scale corporation. Everybody has a stake in this. So it's creating something that's viable within your business structure, but putting the right investment behind it. So that again, it's not just throwing out into the world an unconscious bias course and hoping that one hour facilitated training is going to change perspectives and you know, set you up for success for years to come. That's one step in a long, long, extenuous learning journey. So it's really, again, looking at your top-down leadership structure, being honest and sitting in that space and being comfortable with the uncomfortable, because you may look around your leadership structure and say, hey, you know what, There's, it's really lacking diversity, it's, it, let alone inclusion. So what can we do tangibly? What are these small baby steps and, and part and parcel those? Because we recognize in the DEI space or the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, change doesn't just happen overnight. So it's taking those small, actionable steps, looking at, you know, examples that Vivian and I gave earlier around how can you bring in um, talent from your universities? How can you bring in talent from your communities through co-op or graduate leadership programs? That can be done at small scales or internships in those pieces. How do you take away the bias within your application process? Those are things that we can do regardless of the scale of your company, whether it's, you know, the name bias, whether it's, again, having just forthright conversations and getting to know the people that you're bringing in, checking their methodologies, checking their mindset when they come into your organization. Those are the key pieces because they need to align with your framework. But you need to know what your framework and what your values are as you publicly commit those. And not being afraid to, again, take that public stance if you're passionate about these different pieces in your communities, because that tracks back to, you know, not just talking the talk, but the action everything grounded in actions and what you're actually doing to show that you're committed to the change that isn't a flash in the pan. How does your organization work through the challenging times? Again, when you maybe have an upheaval or something's happening in society that you need to lean in and wrap your arms around your colleagues or community, those are the small, easy, tangible things that regardless of your business structure, we can all do. And you see different industries taking that on. Ben and Jerry, like an ice cream company, who's probably so well known because of their activism way, right? Their ability to entrench themselves and to take a stance. And that's, you know, a very big example. So it doesn't mean that you need to publicly, you know, rebrand uh, your product and have activism slogans. But there are the examples there to show you that there are things that you can do regardless of whether you're a financial banking industry, whether you're in the DEI space, whether you're a nonprofit, there's all things that we can do from our end-to-end -end chain. But it's first acknowledging and saying, you know, where are we at today? Where's our opportunity to improve? And creating those baby steps and goals so that you can, again, make sure it's sustainable and actionable over the long term. Because your colleagues and your community and your customers will look for that um, transparency and that progression of change. Great. Thanks for sharing. You know, the common theme here is uh, the willingness to listen and to understand and learn and being genuine on doing this. And we have a lot of people that are really trying very hard to understand. But very often we hear from employers that they say, I wanted to hire, but I don't know how to manage situations. I don't know what to do. And at to Vivian's point, 
how are we going to manage conflicts? How do we going, are we going to make things work in a good way? So my next question is, what are some challenges you were faced with and how did you overcome them? So Alicia, please, any thoughts? This is a really great question. It kind of just goes to what I was just saying. It's like, what do you do? What is your organization, whether it's at enterprise level, business level, how do you combat the challenges of today? And one example that I can give that really, um, you know, created a level of pause within our organization, because again, we're in the financial industry. So when you think about, are they equipped necessarily, when you think about what happened last year in 2020 with the death of George Floyd in May, um, and the employee feeling the sentiment, our customer sentiment on how that impacted and how that changed perspectives. And again, predominantly, a lot of these things, we view them as American-based problems, but these are Canadian problems too. These are humanity-based problems. So how do you marry the gap in banking and societal issues where, you know, the conversations that we had earlier around bringing my best self to work, if I'm an employee and I'm grieving in this space, or I'm hurting in this space, and I can't acknowledge that and be safe in my work environment, you are going to start to see, you know, a disconnection in my ability to be my best self or to perform at that highest level. So when I think about last year, and even into, you know, as we continue to grow, that was a great point of learning for us to, again, not that, you know, we're new into the DEI space, but it was another opportunity to say, hey, here's another great example of how we can get this right. What forms do we have to bring our colleagues together, not just from a Canadian footprint, but how do we bring the narrative and shared experience from our U.S. colleagues so that we can learn from each other, so that we can sit in the pain, but then also systemically look at our customer policies and practices, look at our employee um, practices as far as from the development. To Vivian's point earlier, we did the same similar work as far as are our people leaders equipped to have these conversations? because these are very real conversations that need to be had and to shy away from them is doing a disservice to that colleague community. So how do we equip our leaders to approach this in a serving way, in a way that creates pause and creates space without you know, victimizing our colleagues or forcing them or feeling like, and again, in our black community, that they need to have the answers and they need to change our structure. It doesn't work that way. It's again, always earning a seat at the community that you're trying to serve and understand. So. There's a lot of reflection that we have. There's a continued reflection that we have to say, let's open up more forms. Let's look at, you know, tangible examples in the market where maybe our policies and how we communicate or negotiate on day-to-day -day banking transactions with our customers can be better. And let's acknowledge those things so that we can actually walk the walk, walk the talk, um, and know where we've got it wrong, but also take those opportunities to get it right, but elicit the feedback, not just internally, to people who are going to tell us what we want to hear. We want to hear what we don't want to hear. We want to be uncomfortable. Um, but eliciting the feedback from our community to say, hey, where are we missing? What, can, what do you expect from your bank? How can we have that rightful dialogue in order to really make sure that, you know, we can overcome and be there and walk lockstep with you to go over some of these uh, societal challenges. That was a big learning for us and how we communicate with our colleagues and our practices to make sure that they're hand in hand both um, and all the way across North America and from our enterprise footprint globally. Vivian, can you share your thoughts on this, please? So one of the challenges that came to mind is that, you know, even as big organizations, and we are fortunate to have enough budgets and resources, right, supporting the DNI initiatives, but sometimes we still find that there are a lot of competing priorities. For example, after last year, what happened, I'm sure a lot of companies will want to champion Black inclusion, and there are a lot of focus is on Black and Indigenous um, inclusion, right? But we also hear from our employees and the customers that um, they don't feel included, right? So we want to make sure that we have a good programs and initiatives in place to address the indigenous and the black uh, talents in the in the, um, the community talent and the challenges they face, but also we want everybody else to feel included. So we looked into the intersectionality of all different diverse groups that you can be from an indigenous community, but maybe um, we realized from analyzing our data that around 30% of people from indigenous community, they also disclose to us as having a disability. 
and there can be indigenous on the uh, women's side and on the LGBT side. So we try to launch initiatives and uh, programs and events that inviting ERGs to partner together. For example, June is Indigenous Month and it's also Pride man Month, right? So how can we plan our events and uh, engage as multiple, as more employees as possible? So that's something that uh, really, um, it's still a challenge and we are trying to uh, look for innovative ways to make people feel um, more, more people feel included and because the inclusion is about every single one of us. Brennan, you spoke about the pillars that uh, 3M has and among those pillars, how do you use some of the resources to overcome the challenges faced? One of the things that we recognize is that um, not everybody is on the same page at the start, right? We recognize that everybody's in a different place and, and uh, we have encountered resistance going through um, these initiatives, right? So, you know, one of the things that we've learned through, you know, encountering this resistance is, you know, understand to come from an angle of, you know, really to seek to understand um, and, and recognize that, you know, it's important to acknowledge that there are differences and, and differences exist, right? Um, but it really starts with treating folks with respect. And that's really what we ground ourselves on is really understand, you know, come from an angle to seek to understand, acknowledge the differences and really start with respect. Oh, the next question is, do you have any goals set out for the next year in terms of inclusivity, uh, Brendan? For this year, what, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking to start an Indigenous ERN um, in Q2 here. So we've currently got a call out for members. We're working through that with a team. Um, we're looking to create a new employee oppor uh, opportunity network uh, in the second half of the year. Um, we see further opportunity on continuing to educate about unconscious bias um, and inclusive leadership. That's an area that we're working on. Um, each of our ERNs um, this year is running a campaign called Three Questions, Three Three Emmers. Um, and it's really um, you know, developed around the specific areas um, specific to those ERNs where employees share situations where they overcome obstacles um, and they share that with um, through video. Um, and we do sessions throughout, uh, throughout uh, team meetings um, where we share those videos and we, we open discussion around that to, you know, the goal to create awareness and a goal to create allyship. Um, so we, that's an area that we're focusing on for all the year ends this year. Um, and, and really, you know, one of our goals is to build on employee engagement, reaching out to our manufacturing sites. Um, you know, it really started in London was, was really where the core started and we're really trying to get out to where our manufacturing and sales are um, throughout uh, Canada. And one of the unique things that actually came from, um, you know, the whole online and work from home experience that we've recognized is that some of our London centric um, initiatives um, where, where it was more groups getting together in conference rooms um, because of the online focus, um, we've been able to actually engage folks in, in BC and, 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 and Halifax and different places where they wouldn't have originally um, been able to be included in some of those things. So we've kind of, you know, won with inclusion by, by you know, understanding that uh, there's a different way of connecting and, and, and just a, a new way that we recognize that uh, opened a door for us here as well. Can you just explain what ERN stands for? Yeah, so it's an employee resource network. Um, so again, we, we've got um, employee resource networks um, um, for, for you know, pride, multicultural, um, we're starting the Indigenous, so yeah. That's... Great, thanks. Uh, the last question that we have here is, uh, can you speak to something that has changed or is a success story as a result of your policy or program? This may be something that has triggered a variety of events in your organization or the community. I'm going to start with Vivian. Um, I'd like to share something, you know, you mentioned about goal setting, right? And that's something that I want to share in RBC. What has changed since last year? Because before the goal, diversity goal setting start from HR, from diversity teams, from recruitment, right? And since what happened last year, the, the, the order has reversed. It comes from the business. 
business has reached out to us and they say, Vivian, can you help us build my inclusive hiring strategy? We want to hire this percentage of Black and Indigenous and people with disabilities, LGBT. How can we achieve that? So we see the amazing mindset as well as the initiative from the business coming to us and ask us to build that strategy. So um, in the past uh, just last six months, we have launched multiple virtual events connecting with the indigenous communities and the black communities in different regions. And what we did was because the team is, no matter how many, you know, you think the big organization has resource, we still feel we're, we're a small team and we build the toolkit. So um, basically enabling um, the local teams and the business to run events, different inclus inclusive events themselves, but we provide the tools. So that's something that has uh, seen, uh, I think it's really powerful and the people have um, come to us and say, thank you. And um, this enablement tool uh, really allow us to go to the community ourselves. And we're here um, always there to support whenever they need us. So I think if that's something um, that's a big change that we see very positive on our side. Now the business is driving diversity and inclusion, not diversity and inclusion is an HR initiative anymore. And also they feel empowered and enabled to drive those initiatives themselves. Okay, thank you. Alicia? I think the biggest thing that we're really proud of in the success story is, is that empowerment of our leadership teams and empowerment of our employee culture. So by, you know, similar to what Vivian's saying, by having an embedding representation, by embedding goals, by empowering the business to know that this isn't just, again, the common mis or misconception uh, is that this is an HR, you know, predominant responsibility. If we can get them right in the front end and we can hire them right, then, you know, the organization's set. And that's not the case. It's creating that value or that, you know, connection at a business leader level. When we think about how vast we are with 90 plus thousand colleagues everyone needs to see a stake and a value proposition in the end-to-end -end inclusion journey and in the model. So whether it be, you know, having diversity and representation goals within the business, by having the top-down accountability where it's baked into their accountabilities and objectives that leaders need to be able to embody leadership inclusionary practices. Those are big pieces that we're quite proud of. But then similar to Vivian's um, structure within RBC, we have the same sorts of pieces where you have your business resource groups. So your BRGs that are really looking to champion change to say, what is the enterprise strategy, but how do I transverse that into my business and make meaning and value of it for the, you know, 100 colleagues that I stare in front of our unique department? How do I then bring that back? And when we look at how do we connect with our customers, if it's a customer facing business, what is our commitment back to them? So examples like I shared earlier around whether it's, you know, are our documents translated? in the communities and branches that they serve? Are we communicating to our colleagues and customers in the languages that they identify with and making sure we're meeting people in a way that resonates with them instead of assuming that people need to act and bank the way that you know culturally we've been grown to kind of understand? That's not the case and we need to respect that evolution. So those are the big pieces of pride where I see leaders now, whether you're in a rural branch or you're in a metro or urban branch, I see them taking that individual commitment to say, I have something as a business leader, as a branch manager, as a shop owner, I'm an entrepreneur and I have a commitment to not just my colleagues, whether it's a small team of 10 or 40 in a branch, I have a commitment back to my community where I need to be present, where I need to be listening and create moments of pause and partnering with events. Again, whether it's you know strategic partnerships with um, Tent or whether it's strategic partnership with an employee or Pink Attitude, there's so many different non-for-profits or different community organizations that are doing great work. It's creating that sense of value or that sense of empowerment to each leader, each employee within the organization to say, hey, I can do and bring my volunteer work back to the organization. I can get funding for that grassroots effort. Everything is a priority because it's a priority to me. My organization cares about that. So creating that narrative and that sense of belief within our colleagues, but within our customers, it works both ways on that model to your first question. How do you acquire talent? You have to be able to be in the community. You have to have proven results. And that's where I think we can be most proud to say TD end to end. Although we still have opportunities to learn and we don't get it right, we acknowledge when we don't. And we make sure that our colleagues have the right resources and supports to make sure that they can either, either understand someone else's experiences 
lean into the gaps, whether it be through training and development or hiring or business models or product lines, leaning into all aspects of the spectrum, because to Vivian's point earlier, none of this can be achieved through intersectionality. So although we have our pillars, we have our real pillars, our black experience, our LGBTQ2+, PWD, we have the structure, but it's getting those pillars and those communities in themselves to communicate. It's recognizing the spectrums within even just the LGBTQ2 plus community and not placing these one size fits all views, but saying, how can you guys do events together? June is a perfect example. There's so many different mind stakes or, or pieces in that month with Pride and Indigenous Month. How do we bring in a will flair where we can show to our colleagues in our community to say, here are empowered leaders um, you know, there are women that represent that intersectionality lens and represent these months and bring it back to that community so that people can see themselves and see value and a commitment to the work. So that's what I'm probably the most proud of um, as, our, as our journey grows and I look forward to kind of where we grow into the future to continue that evolution. Brendan, success stories, examples to share with us. Yeah, so really good example, Vivian and Alicia brought up there, echo that as well. And I, I wanted to leave you with this piece of feedback that we received from one of the sessions after the last International Women's Day campaign we ran this year. Uh, I received some feedback from a manager and I just wanted to leave that with you here. Um, know the session has caused a ripple effect and is driving main, many discussions behind the scenes. Yesterday, one of our male sales managers asked if he could talk to me about gender bias. He was curious to know if I ever experienced it, wanted to gain a better understanding of how it made me a woman feel and how my experience and, and how in my experience did I manage and deal with this, the situation. Our conversation was enriching and he vowed to be more vocal advocate for women. So, you know, really powerful when you're receiving that kind of feedback and you're seeing that happen. Um, that, that's really what we're looking to do, that empowerment, that, that unconscious bias, that, that engagement. Um, we're really looking for that to resonate through everyone here. We're going to have some questions that came through the Q&A right now. And a very recurring question here is about hiring process. And many of those questions are towards the hiring managers. So I'll try to summarize in the four or five questions came from the same team. So if you can highlight some points as to how to train or engage hiring managers, managers in practicing diversity while they hiring, what are some very specific things that can be done? For example, I'm a company of 10 people. I don't have all resources that uh, big organizations do, right? How do I train and engage the manager that is hiring someone to make those things happen, really? I'll start with Brendan. It's a, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, it, it, it starts with, you know, setting expectation and setting understanding, um, really removing that unconscious bias. Yeah, I, I think it's working together with them. Again, if it's a smaller company, there's that opportunity to really um, engage together and, and connect on understanding um, truly what you're looking for um, in that employee and, and setting that expectation and working together with them on that. Vivian, some examples to share? So one of the real um, powerful tools is to invite multiple people into your hiring process, right? Doing an interview panel because people might, you might have bias towards one person, maybe is a fit, you favor one person because we always favor people who are like us, right? But when you engage multiple team members um, and especially team members that represent the community you want to hire from, right? Try to be conscious of that. And the people can have different ideas and different uh, uh, when you uh, calibrate after meeting with the candidate, that brings a more objective view about the candidate to do the job. And some, uh, you know, very simple blind spot examples that we can share with the uh, hiring managers, like, uh, do we have accent bias? In my training, I always challenge our hiring manager between Hugh Grant and the Rush, and they have the same capability, the same resume. Which one would you hire? Which one provide better compensation? Which one do you take to executive meetings and external client meetings, right? And how about eye contact? Uh, North American is a um, 
uh, you know, expecting that everybody has direct eye contact is a symbol of integrity, of honesty, of confidence. But for certain cultures, like indigenous culture or culture from um, Asia, um, not having direct eye, eye contact means a symbol of uh, showing respect. That does not mean that person cannot do the job. So simple blind spot examples like that can help hiring managers. Just it's not that they have they consciously want to have that racism against a certain group of candidates, but it's, um, simply they didn't know. So bring that awareness to the uh, to the organization. In small a uh, small organization, you don't have to spend big budget. I know there are a lot of diversity and inclusion um, external organization. They offer free training. So you can utilize those webinar opportunities. And um, if any company is interested, please do feel free to, con to contact me because I build that training just from scratch and you can do it too. So feel free to contact me. I'll be very happy to share some tips. Alicia, can you share with us your thoughts on, the, on this question? Yeah, I wanna say like, yes, Vivian, because that's exactly it. It's like taking the corporate speak out of it and being really honest about, okay, if you're a small company of 10, understanding, like we said, you've heard the scene throughout the call, understand the community you serve and the different cultural nuances that are within that. So to Vivian's perfect examples, different cultures present differently, they communicate differently. So if you're looking and you have that bias within your process or whoever you've appointed within your organization, they, similar to what we said earlier about bringing in the talent that embraces your values, that person that's representing your brand and communicating externally needs to be that same sort of mindset. So you want to do that check-in with who those talent recruiters are, who is the face of your bank or you know bank or brand that's going out externally to the community to be that brand communicator, to say this is what the principles of our company are. Because although we think in an interview it's self-serving that we're recruiting the talent for our own benefit, they're interviewing us just as much as we're interviewing them. So when you're having that language, you're communicating in a way you're not, you know, forcing based on your own experiences, you know, this is how I'm expecting someone to come correct in an interview because that's how I would prepare. It's really understanding and creating a level of grace and humanity because sometimes we get lost in that. We get lost into the corporate or the business mindset that everyone, you know, you can't have a life. You can't have been down once in your life. You can't have been in a situation where you didn't pay a bill and your credit check comes back bad and we condemn and turn that person away. There's stories. People have lived experiences and stories. Take the time in your hiring practice that if there is something that's a red flag, if there is something that's coming back on your credit check, don't just poo-poo that individual to Vivian's point from an affinity bias perspective or because someone's referred them to you and it's a friend. Take the time and make it intimate in getting to know your candidates and really getting to know them in a, in a virtual-based setting. When you think about this environment uh, with COVID, what it's given us is connection like nationally, globally uh, to different uh, diverse talent slates. So really leveraging that to your advantage. And with you know everything that's happened over the last two years, the community-based resources that, again, if you're not a massive corporation where you don't have, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to invest in this, there's so many, whether it's be free, uh, based community resources um, that are accessed and available. There's so many different event right courses where community practitioners are wanting to impart, where members of the community are wanting to impart and say, this is how, you know, you can understand us. This is how you can look at it from a hiring practice. So taking and creating the space to do that before you come to the table and meet the community, because you want to make sure you remember you're re representing your brand and they're interviewing you. And that's your opportunity to show face. And that's them then creating a level of trust to bring more talent your way. So really understanding who do you have positioned externally to represent that brand. And if they're not there, that's okay. But stand beside them to Vivian's point, bring people into the interview process so that it isn't just on one person. It's on everyone. It's creating a connective community around how we want to incubate and the talent that we want to bring in. So I love that. If I had an emoji, Vivian, I'd be like clapping <laughs> for your point. <laughs> Thanks for that. Well, we have time for two more questions. Uh, so I will, uh, there's a question here. It's pretty interesting. Please advise three key reasons why uh, diversity inclusion is so critical for all businesses. How can small businesses with limited budgets influence leadership on the need for it and adopt best practices 
and diversity inclusion in our organization. So as we're gonna have three key reasons, I want to each of which one of you give one reason for this question. So I will start with Vivian. So when I go out to engage business, the one thing I always say is diversity is not only the right thing to do, but it makes business sense. So I give them a lot of statistics, just like, for example, newcomer, do you know that Canada's population growth will 100% depend on immigration by 2035? And a lot of people don't know. And how much that's going to impact the Canadian economy and the employers that build good newcomer inclusion strategy, that's going to build your competitive edge against your competitors on the market. And the same as a person with disabilities, plus their friends and their family, controls over 50% of the global disposable income, income. And that will help you when you try to engage your senior leaders. When, if you want to, whether you're a small, medium company, you want to be competitive in the market, you really need to look into diverse talent market uh, and a diverse client market. When you don't have your employee base representing the community you serve, you're not going to get their business. So that's something I think uh, it's, um, it's always working for me and I hope it works for you when you go to uh, try to uh, engage your senior leaders. Thank you so much. Brendan, do you have a point to share with us? Yeah, so I, I think one thing we look at is it makes us, you know, it's that opportunity to get that diverse perspective. And really, that's really what's going to drive us to have a more creative, innovative um, ideas and, 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 and results. Um, and, and connecting to our customers, so. I could agree more with this. Alicia, please, one point. Yeah, I was gonna say, like Vivian nailed it, um, but so I'm totally fangirling, but I mean, the reality is that, is that the societal makeup is diverse when you just get down to the brass tacks of, from a race, a cultural, gender perspective. So if you aren't recognizing the shift in society and your company is remaining static, you're missing that entire value chain. You're missing the front end, your customers, you're missing markets, you're missing segments, you're missing the ability to compete. It creates that competitive advantage. You're missing the diversity of thought. You're just out of touch with the complete societal shift in thinking and how they communicate and the technology of it all. So there's no downstream or downside benefit into really embracing the framework of the communities in which you serve. Thanks for that. And uh, two questions are towards the same uh, thing. How do you build psychological safety for black indigenous and people of color i'm going to start with alicia yeah so this is extremely extremely important so you know and i recognize there's different levels of business structures on the line small medium large again corporate structures so i think in, what we've done is we really actively invested in mental health resources so recognizing that not everyone is, even though we've created environments where we, you know, we've empowered our leaders to have thoughtful, robust conversations and create safe spaces within your day-to-day -day job, the reality is not everyone's still comfortable in talking about some of the deep-seated thoughts or things or the mental impacts, because there's lots of work to do in the, um, you know, mental health space from an invisible disability perspective and what, how people associate that to their job. So we spent a lot of resources on looking at external vendors, external counseling services, having, you know, your connection to your TD ombudsman, having your connection to different layers within your business so you can communicate anonymously, but also these external services that when you're at home and you're in a space or you're feeling vulnerable, or you're feeling like there's something mentally that's impacting you and your ability to be that authentic self, that you have free based resources that you can connect into, whether it's childcare whether it's, again, a direct one-to-one -one counseling, group counseling, addiction services. There's so many different spectrums, but knowing that you have, um, whether it be through our wellness-based programs to promote fitness, there's just different things that, again, corporations or businesses through your benefit packages can foster to give employees this outlet so that they can um, have somewhere to communicate with, make sure that their mental health and their sanctity is, is intact, and that they have dialogues, whether it be through the ERG groups where they can communicate and have open forms to talk about the things that are actually happening within their community if they're feeling safe to do that within the work environment. Brendan, you spoke about committees that you have at 3M, but other than this, on a daily basis, how do you make uh, safety spaces for uh, the people that uh, they feel like they're not safe at all? Yeah, so I think, you know, again, it goes back. 
so walking the talk, right? It's it's um, you know treating everybody with respect. It's it's really um, showing them that you care and, and being engaged, listening, um, empowering leaders to to connect at, at, at this level, um, and, and not just be thinking about the the work objective, but really understanding their employees and and being one on one, um, you know, open with them and, and really connecting. Many people understand the importance of uh, diversity and inclusion, but uh, many of them, they don't. So how do you work on this? What initiatives do you have to reach beyond that? Uh, I get it and reach to employers to make it like something that really happens. So maybe you're going to have two types of people there. One that is going to accept, embrace and work towards this, but one that is going to say, okay, I get it, but how do I make it happen? I'll start with Alicia. Yeah, this is big, and Brandon touched on it, right? So when we go through change, it's not necessarily uncomfortable, and it creates waves, and it creates ripples, and it's, again, you can't look at it um, when you're imposing some sort of a change in your structure, especially in the you know diversity inclusion space. You can't look at it, again, like, oh, we need to let go of that leader because they're just not embracing the value. You need to work with them um, and stand beside them and give them the tools but you also need to recognize that there's a lot of times where, you know, people aren't comfortable saying, I don't understand it, or I don't ascribe to that, or, you know, that's not part of my religions or my beliefs. So you need to respect both sides, but also have different checkpoints to check in. So different methods, you can get sound bites to really understand if I deployed this course, or if I changed this policy, what's the downstream impact? And was it successful? Because a lot of times, well, you know, many organizations implement things, but nobody actually goes back and checks to say, was it fruitful? And did it actually transcend across the organization? So when I think about um, some of the things that we do, we have different employee engagement tools. You know, where we'll go out annually and say, you know, it, how is the relationship with your people manager? Here's a safe space where you can anonymously say, you know, what is that interaction model like? What is, you know, the resources and how are you equipped to do your job? But then on top of that, we have that same sort of outlet within our communities. We create that outlet within our ERG groups. And we have that within our accountability. So it's always top of mind that as you're being coached through your career, it is that it, it is that long journey to say, here's training, here's courses, and here's programs. But there are still a lot of people who, you know, to your point in the question, they'll say, yep, yep, I got it. I'm good to go. But we need to recognize that we need to meet these people where they're at. So not having, you know, generic-based programming, having different tiers of programming that attacks that different audience and creating a space to not shame people for feeling and, and you know coming at different spectrums in this, but also behind the scenes, you need to do your due diligence and make business sense of, is my change been in, ingested and um, accepted and adopted in a meaningful way? What are my KPIs, so my key performance indicators on anything that I deploy to really make sure that it hit the mark? And if it didn't, you come back with phase two. You come back and you keep coming back until you start to see in those key performance indicators that the change is happening. And predominantly, like I can't stress enough, um, there's such an urgency, especially in this DI space and over the last few years, that we all want the change tomorrow. So we want everyone to you know, embrace these inclusionary practices. And if I do X tomorrow and in the next two months, I'm gonna see this lift in my business. Change doesn't happen that way. The old saying, you know, Rome wasn't built in the day. People don't change in one day. So give people the time and give them that grace, but have those checkpoints throughout the process so that you can measure and when you see that there's an opportunity, whether it be through your indexes or whatever you're measuring by, based on the scale of your company, you can lean back in. Lean back in and really make sure you have the budgets and the resources to actually do the work. Thank you, Vivian. Alicia touched on a lot of great points. Uh, so to add to those points, one thing I think is very important is uh, showing the um, vulnerability in your leadership uh, team. So vulnerability is, is a strength. Uh, when the leadership's willing to acknowledge that they don't know everything, they don't know every aspect of diversity, they make mistakes in their diversity practice and they listen. So that's going to allow a lot of change happening in the organization. So since last year, what happened um, in June, um, RBC has uh, the leadership team from the OC and G members to all the executives that we hosted hundreds of the listening session. And we changed the, uh, the order around. This is now 
executives are here to learn and the employees are here to tell their stories. So a lot of those stories to be heard and have their voice heard and also, um, you know, acknowledging that executives coming out, acknowledge that I didn't know any, um, a lot of things that are happening and that I have made mistakes. And in my diversity project, I think that's very powerful to encourage all the um, leaders in the organization to, to take that um, uh, change mindset. Another thing that's empowering uh, the, the leaders, not only um, when we are practicing diversity and inclusion, we're helping others, it's actually helping ourselves. We through seeing the greatness and the potential in other talents, we're seeing the greatness of potential in ourselves. It's about raising our own consciousness level to the next um, to the next level, right? So that's all about unconscious bias, right? We eventually want to reach our own conscious level to the next high level. So that's uh, something I want to mention. Thanks, Vivian. Brandon? Yeah, again, really great comments. Um, not a lot to add to that really, but um, really, I guess, recognize it's a journey, um, be transparent, um, be open and, and recognize that we're all in this together and we're all learning together. So it's it's not, uh, and, and we can learn from our mistakes, right? So I think just being open about that. Great, thank you so much for the discussion that we had here. I think it was pretty valuable. Um, great uh, points, great tips. I think everybody can relate and uh, look to themselves and understand what is possible to be done. So thank you again for taking part in the panel today. And I'm going to go back to Kinga right now. Thanks, Fabio. Um, thank you to Ali, Brandon, and Vivian for the very informative and engaging presentations. And to everyone who has joined us today, uh, we really hope that you enjoyed the webinar and will join us for a future one. Um, as I mentioned before, a copy of this webinar will be sent to you uh, at a later date and will also be aired on Rogers TV and be available on their website and YouTube channel. Um, if you want to learn more about either CIS or Employ, we encourage you to visit their website at london.ca slash cdis and employ.ca. Uh, once this web webinar ends, you will be redirected to a feedback survey uh, and we hope that you will take the time to fill it out as it will help us to plan the future sessions. Um, so we hope to see you in the future and thank you for joining us today.